Hello, I'm Tom Lanzillo and this is Climate Duluth. Uh, Climate Duluth is a series of conversations with people from Duluth who are engaged in and working on various environmental and climate change causes. And today I'm extremely pleased to have with us Nicolette Slagle with Down to the Earth. Thanks for being here, Nicoletta. Yeah, uh, you have a very busy schedule, so I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Why don't we just start, if you could tell us a little bit about Honor the Earth okay. and your work with that organization. Sure. Yeah. Um, so Honor the Earth is um, 25 years old. We're a native-led environmental organization that was started by Winona LaDuke and the Indigo Girls um, to help raise awareness of and resources for um, indigenous struggles for land and sovereignty. So we utilize a variety of tactics. Um, we do concerts to help raise money, help raise awareness. We do advocacy work, which includes um, participating in regulatory processes for projects that are proposed that may impact um, sovereign nations. We also do um, technical assistance for tribes, um, you know, reports and research and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so I've been working with Honor the Earth for about four and a half years now. Um, my title is research director, so that basically means that um, it's my responsibility for the research that goes into a lot of the comments that we submit and the technical assistance that we do, um, fact checking for articles and that sort of thing. Oh, wow. Um, in your capacity and with the organization, what are some of the projects then that you've worked on or been a part of? So um, my biggest focus has been um, the Line 3 project. So I've worked pretty extensively on that, um, creating literature, doing community presentations, <clears throat> Um, the biggest project that I've been part of with that has been uh, the completion of a Anishinaabe um, cumulative impact assessment on the Line 3 project. So we tried to assess the impacts of the pipeline from a more indigenous perspective. So looking at um, the impacts from, from well to wheel, so both the impacts in the extraction zone and all down the line versus, you know, the state process, which is a very narrow um, impact assessment. Mm -hmm. A few of the other projects that I've been working on is um, a Rights of Nature initiative for Duluth um, and also I've been active in some research around Green New Deal um, and climate change impacts also. Mm. Uh, what's been sort of your more memorable experiences um, or meaningful experiences that you've been with on the, the Earth Organization? Um, well I've yeah, I've had a lot of different sorts of memorable experiences. It's definitely a dynamic organization. We have a lot of different things going on. We've done, uh, for the first four years, we did an annual horse ride against the flow of um, oil on the proposed Line 3 route. Okay. Um, and so that was, you know, anywhere from a week to two weeks of riding horse um, in the area where the new line was proposed. So that's definitely very memorial memorable. Um, you know, some of the um, personally satis satisfactory experiences that I've had is, you know, I've gotten a lot of good um, responses to the cumulative impact assessment that we've done. I've had, you know, folks that have been involved in the Line 3 battle here, um, thank me for the work, um, and it's, you know, generated interest in um, other pipeline battles also. So, wow. yeah. Are there certain individuals or organizations that you work with in this area on a regular basis? Um, you know, most of, most of Honor's work is um, on the White Earth Reservation, so okay. we've got the, our main core staff is over there and we've been working on um, some projects around renewable energy over there and so that group works pretty closely with REAL, which is the Rural Renewable Energy Alliance. Okay. I think I got, I think I got all those right. Yeah. Um, and they've been, you know, pretty good to work with. They also are associated with um, the Hunt Utilities Group, um, mm. which are a group of really smart folks over by Pine River that, um, you know, have this sustainable living um, demonstration space. And so they've got right. solar panels and sustainable water treatment systems. Um, we stayed with them a couple times on our horse rides. 
Okay. Um, you know, here in Duluth, we are part of the Duluth Climate and Energy Network. Yes. Um, so we've been trying to work on some projects with that group. Okay. Okay. What led you to Honor the Earth, or what were you doing before you joined Honor the Earth? Um, so I kind of came to Honor the Earth roundabout. Um, I'd been following Winona LaDuke's works and writing for a number of years, both in undergrad and in graduate school. Um, before I came to Honor, though, I was actually finishing up a master's of uh, environmental engineering science at Michigan Tech. And I was looking at uh, doing a PhD program there, actually, in oh. um, uh, environmental and energy policy. Okay. And I had wanted to work um, with uh, tribes on the you know, research that I was thinking of doing. And roundabout, I was forwarded um, an internship announcement that was um, funded through the EPA and it had a number of different tribes that were looking for interns and um, including the, the band that was close to Michigan Tech where I was going to school, but there was also one from Honor the Earth. And so oh, wow. I applied, you could apply to three different places. So I applied to three different places and Honor the Earth was the one that asked me if I wanted to work there. And so I accepted and I actually ended up telling um, the school that I wasn't gonna do my PhD because the work that I was going to do at Honor was kind of the work that I wanted to do at the PhD anyway. So okay. <laughs> put that on hold and been with Honor since then. I have to ask, since you mentioned that you've read a lot of things that Winona has written, mm -hmm. um, what was the first time you had a chance to meet her? What was like, what that like for you? <laughs> yeah. Um, it was definitely a very um, intense first meeting. So. We had spoken on the phone once, um, you know, when she called to ask if I wanted the internship position. Um, and then we had kind of messaged back and forth a few times trying to figure out what worked for me to come over that way. And so my first meeting was actually um, at the Black Bear Casino in Cloquet. Okay. Um, there was a group of folks from Enbridge who had come to speak to tribal leaders in the area and she had told me to meet her at this meeting. Wow. <laughs> so I walked into this um, conference room that was, you know, three or four Enbridge folks, a bunch of tribal leaders who I, I didn't know at all because I had, you know, come from Michigan and Pennsylvania before that. Right. Um, I knew who Winona was, but I didn't see her at all there. And so I just like, tried to sit down in the back of the room and you know somebody was like no no come sit at the table and I was like okay you know they were going around and talking about why they were there and what you know what their concerns were and I had just you know I barely knew anything about line three I'd done some research before I started but didn't know much of anything and I was just like I I, I don't have anything to add and you know halfway through the meeting Winona comes you know waltzing in with her entourage and, you know I was like okay there she is and after the meeting was done and um, I come up to her and she's like who are you and I was like I'm, I'm Nicolette I'm your new intern she's like oh great 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 <laughs> <laughs> so and then you know after that we went and got some food and you know talked a little okay. bit more so it was definitely quite a whirlwind of a introduction that's a cool story um <laughs> wow where or when did your interest in the environment and climate change begin uh well i've always been <clears throat> um you know interested in the environment uh, you know as a as a kid my um summers and winters even were spent outside and i always you know had a feeling of um calm or comfort being outside and right. so I think that I've always had a connection to the environment in that sense um, in terms of doing environmental work um, I initially when I started undergrad was looking at going into art school um, huh. but I felt like um, I wanted to 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 go in a path that would allow me to to be um, to give something back. And okay. so I ended up going into landscape architecture, which seemed like to me a combination of art and environment. Um, and I've kind of been on that environmental path since then. Wow. Um, you know, for me, the climate change stuff is um, kind of always been on my radar. I remember um, reading about um, 
you know, some of the original um, climate change meetings that happen and, you know, watching what happened with the Kyoto Protocols and um, how in Portland, you know, even when the United States refused to ratify those protocols that Portland went ahead and did it as a city and that right. really changed their investment into things like public transportation and uh, stormwater management and different things like that. And um, I ended up living out there for about two years and, oh, wow. you know, it's definitely a much more, you know, livable city because they put that investment into addressing their carbon footprint. Okay. Wow. Um, in your life and in your current life, who or what inspires you to do the work you do? Um, well, I think a lot of inspiration comes from, like I said, that um, youthful connection to the environment. You know, I, I feel like um, coming from a relatively privileged background that um, you know, I should use that privilege to, to make a difference. I think a lot of that comes from um, my upbringing, and I had a lot of relatives that did things like Peace Corps, um, oh. and so I think it's kind of been ingrained in me that you, you know, need to make a contribution okay. and give back. Um, you know, on, on a larger scale, you know, some of the things that inspire me are seeing... Um, how a lot of the younger generations are really becoming activated by the climate crisis and really, okay. you know, taking a stand and um, speaking out about um, governments that are refusing to, to do anything about it. Yeah. So those are some of the things. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. Um, when you look at Duluth in this region, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges we're facing as a community in address, addressing climate change and the environment? Um, I think that the the biggest obstacle is really this this false divide between um, labor unions and environmentalists. You know, in in this area, it seems like the narrative of um, environmentalists being you know anti progress or anti unions or anti labor is really strong, and that you know the only way that laborers can have jobs is it through these extractive industries. Um, and, you know, that divide, I feel like, is really going to make it hard for this area to move together into, a, you know, just transition. Hmm. You know, it's not, a, it's not a technological problem. You know, the, the technology and the ideas are out there of how to fix this problem that we're in. It's really a social and political issue. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts or ideas maybe how that communication could improve or, or <laughs> possible for collaboration or? You know, I mean, it's, it's going to take a lot of, of honest um, listening from both sides. Okay. You know, I think that um, environmental groups sometimes forget how um, hard it is to... Uh, I guess to to understand what how I guess empty a promise of a different job kind of seems to be. Okay. You know, if you're looking at at these unions or labors that have a guaranteed job in say the mining industry or pipeline development or or those sorts of things, like in some cases they have a contract in front of them that are signed for work to do. You know, whereas environmental groups are talking about, oh, well if we do more solar panels or windmills or you know green development or what have you those could create jobs also but there's no contract sitting in front of them and so it's hard mm -hmm. to you know kind of take this leap of faith that you know these other jobs will come yeah. um, you know it definitely takes a lot of political will also it takes you know um, uh, local leadership that's that's willing and able to help bridge that divide um, and start putting resources towards these, you know, whether it's job training um, or just investment in some of these renewable technologies that could help shift us away from extractive economies. Right, right. In your time in Duluth with these challenges you were talking about, what are some of the bright spots you see, whether individuals or organizations? What do you... Yeah, where do you see some promise maybe in the future in Duluth? Um, I think that there's 
you know, really a, a very um, active and engaged youth um, movement in Duluth. Right. You know, it seems like, um, you know, the the youth that were involved in um, the opposition to the NTEC plant um, have kind of grown and take on a life of their own, you know, the climate strikes that they've been planning, um, and it seems like they've gotten a lot of support also from different faculty at their schools, and mm -hmm. so I really do think that, um, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity in uh, youth that are, that are, you know, going to be facing the brunt of the, the climate chaos, right. um, being empowered to speak their voices, and hopefully that empowerment will include equipping them with the tools to make the changes that we need to, need to yeah. make. Yeah. One thing I like to ask guests is, because of the work you do, mm -hmm. has it changed you personally, either your lifestyle, the way you look at your life? Yeah, how has your work affected you personally, if at all? Um, yeah, it definitely has. I mean, I stopped eating meat, um, well, gosh, almost 20 years ago now, oh, wow. um, because okay. of, you know, the realization of um, climate impacts that it has. Um, okay. I've tried to, you know, localize my diet um, and reduce my carbon footprint when possible. It's It's been kind of hard being in Duluth and doing that because it's, I mean, American cities just are not built for you know, biking or walking or public transportation either. Right. Um, you know, and I, I try to, um, you know, also uh, contribute to causes or organizations that I feel like are making a positive change. And so, you know, that might be something as small as paying the extra $6 to offset my carbon when I fly to Finland, for example, or, okay. you know, things like that. Um, I just recently invested in an organization that's um, using a mycelium technology for carbon baking. So huh. basically they're reforesting um, riparian zones around rivers to, you know, both address uh, environmental degradation, um, women and children uh, education, and also right. um, the climate change by sequestering carbon in the soil so okay. cool yeah wow um currently now and in the near future what will you be working on focusing on in your life yeah yeah so right now i'm actually um finishing working on um a climate vulnerability uh literature review for the red cliff band um wow. so they're working on their um integrated resource plan that most tribes have. They review it every 10 years and they wanted to include some information about climate change in this revision. So oh, wow. I've been reviewing um, some other climate vulnerability assessments that have been done in the region okay. um, and compiling that information so that they can include it in their planning. Um, in addition to that, I've been working with a group of folks to look at what um, a rights of nature initiative could look like for Duluth. So right. we're hoping to be hosting um, a community workshop soon at ACO okay. to help educate folks about what is the rights of nature, what does it mean, was it, what could it look like for Duluth. Um, and a little bit further down the line, I'm actually looking at starting a PhD program. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, what will be your major concentration, do you think? Well, I'm, I'm hoping to focus on um, phytoremediation, which is um, using plants and microbial activity to uh, remediate contaminated soils. Huh. Um, and also hoping to look at how that can be combined with that mycelium um, carbon baking technology that I spoke about. Wow. So. Will you be doing that in the United States or somewhere else? Um, or? In Finland. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, you've mentioned Finland twice, so yeah. is, is Finland in your future? Or? Uh, yes, Finland is in my future. Um, my wife is Finnish, and uh, I live there. We lived there together for about three years, and then we've oh. been back in the States for about a year, okay. um, and now we'll be moving back to Finland. So. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, what are your um, 
kind of as you leave Duluth, what are your hopes for Duluth? Um, you know, Duluth is is it's a beautiful city. Like I just I love um, living on the the lake so much. I I grew up on Lake Erie, and so oh. living on Lake Superior seems very familiar to me. Okay, and you know, I I really do hope that the city and the region can find a way to to come together and you know like i spoke about bridge that divide between right. you know the environmentalists and the labors and okay. you know find a way that that's a, a path to a sustainable future that's good for everyone okay okay cool well i really want to thank you for being with us today i really appreciate it and i wish you the best of luck yeah. and hopefully we'll stay in touch yeah um, to close the show today, I would like to read a short excerpt um, by Ian McCullum. And make sure I get the right selection here. It's entitled, A Sense of Place, A Sense of Self. He writes, all mammals from bats and polecats to tigers and chimpanzees share more than 90% of our DNA. Crocodiles and birds share more than 80% Fruit flies around 40%. A fungus is closer to being human, about 20% of the human genome, than a plant, which is 10 to 15%. We are not only related, we belong. The animals are in our blood, but let us not forget that we are in their blood also. We too, Nush and Nell, we too have our alarm calls, our cries of territory, of sexual display and discovery. We experience fear, frustration, and rage. And we are not the only ones who die of a broken spirit. Let us not forget that the landscape is in our skin as well. Every element from silica and hydrogen to lithium, phosphorus, and gold can be traced in the human body. The poets are right. We are the dust of the earth and of the stars. Take care.